Before our time, and before the time of gods, there was no cosmos, there was no light, no dark, no heat, no cold. There was nothing, and over time, a warm mist and a frozen mist formed, and these mists grew and flowed slowly towards each other, their coming together, a careful inevitability. And when that time came, from where the mists touched, three primordial beings were formed, not men, not gods, but the first beings of the cosmos. Two were in the shape of men and would be known by their ancestors by the names of Manu and Jimo. They were brothers, twins, and with them was an animal that would provide them sustenance on their journey, a cow. As time passed, so the brothers drifted through the cosmos. The gods came to be, the demons came to be, and chaos came to be. And chaos has a way of disrupting order, and chaos is the friend of no one. And there it caused conflict between the gods and the demons. Manu and Jimu felt they needed to have a home, to have a place where they could fight chaos and create order, for that is the way of the best lives. And with this idea, Jimu said that he would sacrifice himself for the future of Manu and the gods. Manu thanked Jimu for his sacrifice and took his breath from him, and Jimu's life left him as he became the first death in the cosmos. Hi, I'm John White, a specialist in Indo-European mythology, and what you've just heard is the introduction to the myth of creation from our Indo-European ancestors. The cosmos is created, and then the primordial being of Manu, representing the first man, sacrifices his twin Yemo, who represents the first king, and Manu builds the world with Yemo's body parts, before creating man from some of them too. And if you're interested in hearing more about that, then you can watch my video about it here. But today I will fill in a blank I have not yet discussed. As whilst I've spoken about what happens to Yemo's physical body, from which the world and man is created, Yemo's story doesn't end there, as Yemo's death was the first death in the cosmos, the first sacrifice. And that has significance in Indo-European cosmogony. And today, if you watch until the end of the video, you will find out about his position as ruler of the afterlife, the lord of death. You'll find out where his realm is, and what all this meant for our ancestors when they died. So, grab yourself a cup of tea, and welcome to Crackenford. <music> to delve into this subject, we will look at a number of Indo-European cultural texts about Yemo, or particular cultures equivalents of this figure, from India to Ireland to Germania, Persia and Greece. And so, to our first part of the journey, which begins with the Indic Yama. In Vedic literature, the Proto-Indo-European figure of Yemo is presented as Yama, and is said to be the first mortal who chose death freely. And whilst the nature of his death is not obvious within the Vedic texts, if we consider the figure of Purusa in the poem of the Rig Veda 1090 as replacement of Yama of the Rig Veda 10.13.4, then it is clear, when compared with Iranian texts, that Yama's death was a sacrificial death at the hands of his twin Manu. We also see that Yama is never a god in the Vedas, but instead is referred to as a king, and this keeps his Indo-European position, as Yemo was considered the first king. This title he takes with him after his death, and into heaven, where he is said to reign over the departed souls. We can also read more about this in the Rig Veda 10, 14, 1 and 2. We bring gifts with libation to King Yama, Gatherer of mankind, son of Vivasvat, who went forth to the great heights, who showed the path to many. Yama first found a way for us. This cattle pasture is not to be born away from us. Where our fathers of old have gone by this path, those who are born after selves should go. Here, the path of Yama is death, and as all mortals are, well, mortal, then they will all follow this path. And the term the path of Yama shouldn't be dismissed as just a metaphor. Yama's realm does have some tangible qualities, and we've touched on this before in stories of the ferryman of the dead. The dead were buried with coins to give him, and these physical coins meant that there was a perceived physicality to him. And so we see this with Yama's realm, which is said to be the highest in heaven, and have an entrance to it in the southern world region. This realm is presented as a good realm in the Vedas, primarily characterised by feasting, light, beauty and happiness. 
However, in Puranic literature, which is the Sanskrit writings outside the Veda, Yama is regularly portrayed in a horrific and sometimes ghoulish manner. And within this text, there is one notable exception of this paradisal palace in the Malabharata, which I mentioned in this video. But we do see some of this fearsome aspect in the Rig Veda in verse 10, 97, 16, where the foot fetter of Yama is mentioned. But this image is derived from the Indo-European theme of the bonds of death and the use of the noose, which I talk about in the video on the Indo-European goddess of death. And we know this because the fetters and the noose originally had no association with the ruler of the dead, but instead belonged to death herself, personified as the goddess called Koli or the coverer by the Proto-Indo-Europeans. Celtic evidence for a lord of the dead should start with a line from Archiza's Di Bello Gallico, which states, all the Gauls proclaim themselves to be born from Father Dis, and they say this is revealed by the Druids. So, who is Father Dis or Dispata? Now, due to Interpretato Romano, so where the Roman authors would use Latin names of the equivalent Roman deity as opposed to the Celtic god's name, we see that they are referring to the Roman god of the underworld. But what is interesting here is that the author did not refer to him as Pluto, the usual name, and one that this text is often mistakenly translated to, but as the father of death. And this emphasis tells us that Druidic teachings have this deity as the primordial father who, by his name, was also regarded to as Lord of the Dead. And this aligns to the ideology we saw in the Vedic sources. But this isn't the only evidence. There are mentions in Irish literature of the other world, although often written about as a fairyland or paradise, but it is referenced as a realm of the dead as an island to the southwest of Ireland known since records began as Tech Duin or the House of Don. This island takes its name from a story in the Level Govola Arayan, or in English, the Book of the Taking of Ireland. In this story, the sons of Mill, where Mill is the ancestral hero of all the Irish, we find out that his sons are the first humans to uh, inhabit Ireland and it is his eldest, Don, who we are most interested in and who is identified as the king. And the story goes that the sons of Mill made two landings on Irish soil. After the first, they defeated the Tutha de Danan, the gods who previously inhabited the island, and so established their claim to the island. But the Tutha de used magic powers to force the sons of Mill back beyond the ninth wave offshore, and where they had to remain for a total of three days. And then, when trying to get back to shore, Don climbed the mast of the ship and took the full force of a curse cast by the Tutha de Danan and Don died and fell into the sea, whereupon his brother Avagin declared Don's folk would travel to his last resting place when they died. And it was Don himself who set down the following decree. A stone cairn was raised across the broad sea for his people, a long-standing ancient house, which is named the House of Don, after him. And this was his mighty testament for his hundredfold offspring. You shall all come to me, to my house after your death. And so with this story, we have Don as a king, the first king of Ireland, a Yemo equivalent, Yemo as a king, alongside the fact that he's the first to die and establish a place for the dead over which he rules. And with him in this story, his brother, Avalon, who is in a priest role, was considered a Manu figure. And so this story aligns to the Indian Yama and to Kaiser's Dispatter, there is also another Don in Celtic mythology who adds value to her journey, and that is Don Cooley, the Dark Ball of Cooley, the prize that was sought in the book uh, The Turnbow Cunha, which is also a great story and worth a read, and one I'm about to spoil if you haven't read it. As at the end of this epic, Don, the Dark Ball, fights his rival, Findivaloch A, uh, the White Horned Bull of A, and Don rips the White Bull's body apart. And part of the bull's body land across the island, creating the Irish landscape. Now this can be seen as an Irish Celtic reflex of the creation myth of the Proto-Indo-Europeans, and I talk more about these myths here. And yet, Don also is the sacrificer. 
so the Manu figure, as opposed to the Yimo figure, who is the sacrifice. And this is because the myth has taken the creation through sacrifice ritual and evolved it into a creation through combat ritual. In effect, what has happened is that usually the victim of the sacrifice stands out as being the most admired figure, as he has given up his body to create the world. However, in combat, the figure who loses, who is dismembered, torn apart in this example, this is not an admired figure. That goes to the figure who wins the combat, the conqueror, the victor. And so after death, this figure is elevated to that. And so the myth has been adjusted and the story then goes on to say how Don died shortly after Vivenok, a suffering from a broken heart. So also allowing his body to become part of the Irish landscape. And so we could argue that Don is both the role of Manu and Jimo, if applied to the Proto-Indo-European myth. He is both the sacrificer and the sacrificed, but he also becomes the Lord of the Dead. And this is emphasised by his name, meaning the Dark One, derived from Proto-Indo-European Dusno. And so cognate with the Welsh Dun and the Old English Dun and the Latin Fuscus. And we see this word used in Christian sources as an epithet for Satan. And then this allows us to consider whether it is a descriptive term which has replaced a proper name, an older proper name. And if this is the case, we might derive the Irish name Amon from this meaning twin as an old Irish reflex of Yemo. But we don't have an Amon in Irish folklore, we can connect to this. But there is a potential confirmation in a rather unexpected source. Within the tales of the old Irish Imranama which means voyage, uh, there is an island paradise named Amin Ablach. And in most translations, this name is left as is. But if we did translate it, we would take the Ablach to mean having apple trees. And Amin is an alternative form of Amon, which can mean twin. And we see this again in another important Irish place name, Amen Macha, the twins of Macha, where Macha gives birth to twin boys. But if we go back to Amen Ablach, where, and it being an island paradise, as we talk about in this video, another worldly island, its name can be interpreted as the twin of the apple orchard, which is often a found feature of both Celtic and Germanic other worlds. And the twin in question is the lord of that island, renamed Don within Celtic tradition. But following our journey back, we see is actually derived from the Proto-Indo-European Emo. And links to the Lord of Death in Indo-European cultures doesn't stop with the Irish. As we have Germanic sources that correspond to this pattern we're seeing in other cultures. And I'll read an abridged passage from the first chapter of Havara Saga, where the realm of King Guthmund is described as Ymis land was in the south in the middle of Halagor land. Guthmund is the name of the ruler of Jotunheim. His dwelling is at Grund in the district of Glasivillea. He was a powerful man and wise, and he and all his men were so old that they outlived many generations. Therefore, he the man believed that Ordain Sakar must be in his kingdom, the place in which sickness and old age depart every man who comes there, and where no one is permitted to die. After the death of Guthmund, men sacrificed to him and called him their god. This description of Odin Saka, again, as discussed in my Paradise video, is a description of Paradise and is referenced elsewhere in Old Norse mythology, such as in Eirik's saga as that place which heathen men called Odin Saka, and Christian men called it the land of living men or Paradise. What is not usually understood though is that this text it explicitly states that in Odin Saka no one is permitted to die, while making reference to Guthman's death in the very next sentence. This text doesn't actually say that Odin Saga was in Jotunheim, where Guthman ruled, only that he the men believed it to be there. Clearly, they were mistaken given the evidence of Guthman's death, which meant he the men didn't die there. Now, this is where I could suggest a bias with the Christian author who is trying to cast doubt on this belief. But we see in Arik Saga a set of directions for reaching this realm, as the saga is concerned with the quest of Arik to find Odin Saga. Now he leaves Norway and travels south through Denmark and to Constantinople, where he has the following conversation with the king. Arik asks, 
What is beyond the earth? The king said, a great sea called ocean. Erdik asked, where is the outmost land in the southern hemisphere? The king answered, we say that India is at the end of the lands in that hemisphere. Erdik asked, where is the place which is called Odensaka? The king said, we call this paradise or the land of the living. Erdik asked, where is this place? The king said, in the east is this land, furthest from India. And another spoiler alert, Eric follows the king's directions and goes southeast beyond India and reaches Odensaka. Although here we do see that the Christian author and that paradise itself lies still farther beyond Odensaka. But so we see that this paradise is in the south, the same as Yama's realm and Tekhtuin, and in contradiction to what heathen men believe. And so if we look back at the text from Vara Saga, we see that Ymir's land is in the south and that Ymir is cognate with Twin and Yimo and therefore Imon and Yama and Ymir is the sacrificial victim of the Old Norse creation myth. And so putting that together, we conclude that this was not Uthmund who was the king of paradise, but Ymir, the twin, who was the first to die and so was Lord of the Dead. In Iran, there is a figure named Yima, derived from the Proto-European Yimo, and Yima's mythology is complicated, very complicated. But in synopsis, he was the first man and first king of Iranian mythology, but was displaced by two non-Indo-European figures drawn from local Iranian mythology. But the mythology goes on to say that he, Yima, remained the greatest king for most of the first millennium in their world history but he was overthrown by a usurper and fled, but was caught after a hundred years um, by his brother, who then cut his body into two. And so the story Yimma reflects Proto-Indo-European mythology and cosmogony, but here it seems to stop as after death, nowhere in Iranian mythology is there an explicit mention of Yimma as Lord of the Dead. And this is not surprising given Zarathustra's doctrine on monotheism as there could be no lord in heaven but Herhura Mazda. And so all other pre Zoroastrian figures who played this role were removed. And Yima was a victim of this as well as being condemned by Zarathustra for having introduced the eating of meat. So this left Yima relegated to a position considerably important inferior to that which he enjoyed prior to Zarathustra. And so such relegation probably means he was also removed from his place as Lord of Death or Lord of Paradise, which was now the realm solely of Ahura Mazda. And we can find support to this theory in the account of Yuma's paradisial realm, the famous enclosure of Yuma as related in the Vidavat 220 to 43. That's the Venidad and I'll put a link to the translation here. Now the story of his realm, which is, as an aside, is influenced by the Mesopotamian flood myth, tells how Ahura Mazda and Yima each held gatherings at the centre of the earth in the homeland of the Aryas, with Ahura Mazda assembling deities and Yima assembling the best of mortals. Once all were there, Ahura Mazda spoke to Yima, warning him of destructive winters to come and urging him to build an enclosure which the best men, animals, plants and fires would survive. And here the Ahura Mazda's directions are quite precise and when Yima asks how he is to construct such an enclosure he is told, stamp the earth apart with your heels, squeeze it apart with your hands, as men separate earth when it is fluid. What is described here is a metaphor to the potter's will suggesting that Yima carved the enclosure out of earth. And here, as Pallavi text Mignog i Zrad tells us, the enclosure made by Yima was in the home of the Arias below the earth. And the genus and species of every creature and creation of Hormazad, the lord, the best and most choice of men and horses and cattle and birds, each was brought there. And every 40 years a child was born to one man and one woman of that place and their lives were 300 years long and their pain and misfortune were very slight. And so physically Yima's enclosure is a world of perfection, an underworld uh, and a world without cares and much like paradise at first glance. 
But in other texts, this place has properties associated with the other world, which is the absence of many things, including death. But as discussed earlier, despite Yimma building the enclosure, it is never stated that he actually rules over it. That position is taken up in the surviving texts by Zarathustra and his son, Urvatat Nala, an obvious Zoroastrian construction, if you look at it. And thus it makes it clear that another mythological figure was in the role prior to Zarathustra. And based on comparative evidence and mythology, this figure was the one who constructs the enclosure. Yima. Now, if you think the Iranian link was complex, things get even trickier when it comes to the Greeks, as Greek mythology has evolved significantly over time with influence from visits to Indian Iranian cities for culture and trade. And the result is that there is a lack of first man figure in their mythology. Uh, there are heroes found in cities, but these are local myths with local heroes. And you have uh, Cadmos for Thebes and uh, Cecrops for Athens. And as such, these have no Indo-European heritage. And within these texts, such as in Hisoi Siogony, humans are rarely mentioned, with most actions taking place in the divine realm. And here, most of the primordial beings are female, with Gaia and Nyx being some of the better known. But if we look to the Titans, then two males do stand out, Uranus and Kronos. And we could say that the castration of Uranus by Kronos was a reflex of the Proto-Indo-European myth of creation. As we see in other myths, body parts become specific parts of the cosmos and in this case Uranus's blood produces the Furies and his phallus Aphrodite and with this in mind when we look at the works of Hesiod and Pindar Kronos appears as ruler of the Isles of the Blessed located at the ends of the earth and which is seen as a paradise reserved for heroes and so we have a problem here Kronos seems to have taken the place of the Lord of the Dead and not Uranus who made the sacrifice. Now, whilst not without issue, we could argue that this is because the castration of Uranus separates Uranus from Gaia, who represents the earth, leaving Uranus, whose name means sky, to go up to heaven where he lives out his days having no practical purpose, or Tios, if you would, which then leaves Kronos to replace him as Lord of the Dead, the dismemberer, a substitute the dismembered, the victor for the vanquished, just as Don Cluny assumes the role which would have been expected to go to Vivinae in the Irish myth. However, and there are lots of howevers in this, we also see Radamanthus and Menelaos mentioned as being rulers of the Elysian fields in Homer's Odyssey, where Proteus prophesies to Menelaos, It is not ordained by the gods for you, O Menelaos, beloved of Zeus, to die in the Argive fields and reach your fate. But the immortals will lead you to the Elysian field, at the ends of the earth, where fair-haired Radamanthus dwells, and where life is most free from care for men. There is neither snow, nor much of cold, nor rain, but always Okeanus rouses blasts of the whistling breath Zephyr to call men. For you possess Helen, and to the gods are a son-in-law of Zeus. Now, the association of Radamantis with the other world is quite common, but Menelaos is less so. And so it is actually explained that he is the husband of the divine Helen. But why these two? Well, both are kings and heroes, and some also believe that both are twins, with Menelaos the son of Zeus and Europa, and Menelaos the younger brother of Agamemnon. However, a passage from Aeskylos suggests something different. This is the tenth year since Priam's great adversary, Melanaus the king and Agamemnon, twin throned and twin sceptred by Zeus's, the twin Aetrides' grace, firm in their fame. The twin Aetrides put forth from these lands a thousand Argive ships. Now, whilst this on its own is not enough to say that this is absolutely so, as the Greek evidence has been much transformed as a result of this rich synthesis amongst Indo-Europeans, Old European and Near Eastern mythologies, but there is clearly enough evidence to suggest that at least one of Kronos, Radamanthus or Menelaos 
have succeeded to the position of the early Indo-European Lord of the Dead, whose name was Yimo, the twin. And so there have been a number of academics who have helped bring our understanding forward with regard to the Lord of the Dead. Worth noting is Kuno Mayer's work on the Irish Death God and the Isle of the Dead, where he compares Yama with Don and Dispatter and reaches the conclusion that they all derived from a proto Indo European figure regarded as both the first man and the ruler of the dead. But it is Gunther who used Indo Iranian evidence that this first man, first of the dead, was Yimo, who offered himself as victim in the first cosmogonic sacrifice. And it is on his research that academics could confirm this conclusion. Yimo's death established the model for all deaths to follow, but it was also sacrificial and a creative act allowing the world to be built. But as we have seen here, and in some of my previous videos, it allowed the realm of the dead to be established, a realm that resides within the cosmos, within our world, an integral part of it. And as such, we can say that the world of the living and the world of the dead are connected, all parts of Yimo's body. The Lord of the Dead's realm was often considered a paradise. But this was due to it being absent of many things that caused unhappiness, such as sickness and cares and death and extremities of climate. But there are stories from Indo-Europeans that speak of the realm of the dead as being a fearful place, dark and filled with serpents and monsters. And we see this from sources such as Homer's description of Hades and Old Norse accounts of hell, or the picture of Dusox presented in the Arda Wiraz Namag. But what we can't be sure of is whether this is the same realm as that of the Lord of the Dead, but viewed from a different perspective or whether it was a completely different realm. This isn't clear. But what we do know from the text we've looked at today is that it was located in the south, Yama's realm was south, Tekduin was in the southwest relative to Ireland, and Odensaka is in the southeast. It is clearly not high in the sky or deep underground, it was part of this world, and perhaps that has something to do with Yemo being mortal and not a divine being. But why in the south? Well, Perhaps with these cultures being in the Northern Hemisphere, going south means going into a lighter, warmer world, maybe hinting at a more paradisal environment. And so what can this tell us about the death of our ancestors? Well, Yimo was the first king, but he is also human's last king, the king who rules over the departed. He greets these people as a king in their death, but also as a father, for he is the primordial father. As according to Proto-Indo-European creation myth, it was from his body that man was created. And so when you die, when you reach your end, you are reunited with your absolute beginning. And that is now the role of Yimo, Lord of the Dead. And if you want to know more about those who influence death, then I can recommend this video on Kolyo, the proto indo European goddess of death. Now I hope you enjoy that journey, and until the next video, please stay safe and stay well. And this was Kleckenfeld. <laughs>